Father, show yourself real to us this morning. And Father, help us to block out any distractions during this time, Lord. Help us to stay focused, Father, as we get into your word. Father, we give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says amen and amen. Well, remember, last week we were in the book of Luke. We were in chapter 24. We were looking at some things, and uh, I'm just going to do like a, a little recap for the sake of those uh, who weren't here last week, or maybe they didn't write notes, and uh, you know, it's good to do a, a recap. And so we were in Luke chapter 24, we were also in verse 47, and here in Luke 24, 47, remember what had happened was Jesus had went to the cross, and after going to the cross, he went to hell in our place for three days. He rose from the dead, and he spent 40 days. Remember that? He spent uh, 40 days with the disciples before going to sit at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, it was interesting. A lot of things were happening during this time. And, and the bottom line is, after he appears to his disciples, this is what he says in Luke 24:47. Well, let me back up to 46. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So last week we looked at a couple of things. We looked at the repentance and we looked at the remission of sins. And I shared with you what the definition of repentance is. And it's a sincere turning away in both mind and heart from self to God. That's what repentance is. You know, when we tell God that, hey God, I'm sorry for, for, for doing that, we're telling him that, you know, we're sincerely going to turn away from that and we're not going to be doing those things no more. That's uh, repentance right there. And then when Jesus talks about this remission of sins, he's, it's talking about forgiveness. And when we offer God this sincere turning away from, in both mind and heart, from self to Him, He offers us the remission of sins, or in other words, forgiveness. He says, you know, whatever it is that you did, it's, it's forgotten. It's, it's been you know, cleared. The slate is clean. That's what he tells us. That's what he offers in return. And not only does he offer that, he offers so much more. But see, I mentioned last week that for many of us, we have this spiritual experience with God. We open up our hearts and we, we have this repentance going on, right? We're sincerely sorry for the way we've been living. And we receive the remission of sins, the forgiveness from God. And although we have this spiritual experience where God forgives us for our sins because we're sincerely sorry and the slate is wiped clean, you know, there's still more change that has to take place. And that change that has to take place is right up in here. And oftentimes, many of us don't allow God to change what's going on in here. And so because of that, we had to look at how man is a three-part being so that we can understand, you know, the way we operate. You know, just like the way God is a three-part being himself. He's the Father, he's the Son, and he's the Holy Spirit. He's the Trinity, right? That's called the Godhead. He's a triune God. There's three parts to him, but he's yet one God. But yet, he, he's distinct in these three different ways. And I know it's often hard for many people to grasp that concept, like, well, hold on a second. How can he be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and still be just one person? Well, that's the way he set things up. And I know oftentimes, for us, it's hard to understand these things, you know. And so, many people have created a lot of analogies to kind of give us a better insight in understanding some of the spiritual concepts, right? You know, I, I often like to talk about how I, I like the, you know, what a person ha has 
you know, shared with us in regards to water. How water can come in three different forms, but yet it's still H2O, right? Does anyone know what three ways water can be in? It could be a liquid, like we drink it, right? It could be solid, right? Ice cube, right? Right? And then it could also be what? Like a mist, right? But yet it's still water. It's just in a different form or in a different, uh, I'm trying to think of a word here, but it's water. Whether it's liquid, whether it's solid, or whether it's the mist, it's still the same thing. Somebody even used the analogy of an egg. They said there's three parts to an egg, but it's still an egg, right? You have what's in the center? The yolk. And then what's outside the center? You have the egg white. And then what's outside the egg white? The shell, right? There's three parts to an egg, but it's still an egg, right? Does it make it three eggs because there's three parts to it, right? Do they make you pay three times uh, for that egg, right? No, they charge you for one egg, right? So the bottom line is this, is there's three parts to it. And so what's interesting is how God is the Father, He's the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit. And as we study the Bible, He explains each of the roles of the Godhead. You know, we all understand the, the Father, God the Father part. Jesus explains the Son part as we read the, the Gospels. And now we're getting into the Holy Spirit part. What, what's the, the role of the Holy Spirit? And as we get into the role of the Holy Spirit, we have to understand that we as people are three-part beings, right? We talked about that last week, right? And, and so the, the thing is this, is as we understand how there's three parts to us, do we want to pay attention to one part more than the other? Yes, we do. When it comes to our composition, how we're made up of three different parts, we want to pay a, a attention to a specific part of us more than the other, and I'll explain why. Let's look at the three parts to us. Okay, so we know that we are what again? We are spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Last week we looked at a lot of scriptures of how the spirit and the soul are not the same thing. I gave you a, a lot of different uh, references in the scriptures of how the spirit and the soul are different things. Right? I gave you Hebrews 4.12, uh, I think I gave you, was a, a reference last week. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is another one. But hold your place in Luke, because we're going to come back to that. So we're going to be going to 1 Thessalonians, right? And we're going to be going to, let's see here, chapter 5. Does everyone know where 1 Thessalonians is at? Remember, if you don't know where it's at, use your, your table of contents. It's okay. First Thessalonians. Would anybody like to read First Thessalonians? Five twenty what is that? Five twenty three? Any volunteers? Go ahead, Yvette. Thank you. Did you guys all get that? Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and read it. Thank you, Yvette. First Thessalonians 5:23. She said, "Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." Did you guys get that? Spirit, soul, body. 
they're separate from one another, the spirit and the soul. Oftentimes, many people uh, mistakenly say that the spirit and the soul are one in the same. They're not one in the same. And that's okay, but it's just people not understanding that the spirit and the soul are distinct from one another. And we're going to take a look at what those distinctions are. Because we need to understand that. Because oftentimes we're trying to do spiritual things and we're not using the spirit man. So remember, you're a spirit, soul, and you're a body. Okay? So the first one. When you're dealing with feelings, that's the voice of your body. We talked about that last week. Feelings. Remember we talked about that? A lot of times we follow our feelings more than we follow our spirit. Right? We talked about how a lot of times we don't feel like doing things and we go with the feelings because you don't feel like it. Right? That's the voice of your body. That's all that is. That's called the what? The flesh. Right? The flesh. Okay, the second thing. Your reasoning. That's the voice of your soul, right? And your soul is, where's your soul? It's right up here, right? Above your neck, that's your soul. That's the, the reasoning, uh, and that's the voice of your soul, your reasoning. And then number three, your conscience. That's the voice of your spirit. That's right here. Commonly known as your heart's. They oftentimes use that in the Bible. They'll use the example of heart or spirit. But the conscience is the voice of your spirit, right? And that's who the Holy Spirit primarily speaks to. It's your spirit, right? The spirit part of you, okay? And so that's why oftentimes when we get into some trouble, it's because we're not following the leading of the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes we're not following the leading of the Holy Spirit is because we have not developed our spirit man enough to understand how to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, because many times if you, if you, if you listen and you work on hearing and how to, how to identify following the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to identify when the Holy Spirit is talking to you. And when he does, it's a very great thing. When you're able to listen and you're able to say like, oh, okay, yeah, I need to do this or no, I shouldn't do that. And then later on, as time goes on, you realize, wow, that was, that was, that was God. Because how else could, you know, I have known this or how else could I have had insight to this particular area right there. And it's so awesome when you're able to follow the Holy Spirit because you know, God knows all, right? God knows all, and he wants to share that with you in a particular area. We have to learn to develop how to follow the voice of God, right? But too many times we follow what? Feelings. And that is commonly referred to as our flesh. The flesh will get us in trouble when we follow these feelings, right? Because what are feelings? They're temporary, Right? And they work against us oftentimes. And so that's why we have to learn not to go and follow our feelings. You know, what happens when you get angry? Right? You want to let others know that you're angry, right? How do you let them know you're angry? You want to get their attention. Usually you raise your voice, right? Start throwing things. I don't know, holes in the wall. I, I don't know. Am I, am, I, am I getting warm? <laughs> right? We all get angry at times. But it's not about being angry. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a feeling. It's what you do with the anger. Just because you get angry, does that mean that you have to explode uh, on somebody else? Right? Somebody, you know, got you mad. Well, how did they get you mad? Oftentimes, people make you mad, and they probably don't even know they made you mad. But you're mad. So the question is, what do you do with that anger? Well, you've got to learn how to control those feelings. Because if you don't, it's going to get you in trouble. And that's why we want to be Holy Spirit-led. That's what we've been talking about. 
You want to follow the conscience, the inner man, right? And, and the thing is this, is if you've been conditioned so much to follow your feelings, yeah, it's a process to start following the Holy Spirit because you're used to doing your thing. Following your feelings is doing your thing, right? Because who does it benefit? Nobody but you. And so that's why we have to learn how to develop the spirit man so that we can hear from God and that we can follow the leading of God. Because he will lead us if we just listen. If we take the time to say, okay, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? He will tell you. But oftentimes we don't give him enough time to answer or we don't even, even ask him. We just do what we want to do. And who cares what anyone else says? That's okay, but you're going to keep getting, you know, I would say so-so results. Because the bottom line is God knows all. And if you follow him, he's not going to do you wrong. He's going to, you know, make sure that you don't end up in a dead end. He's going to make sure that you don't hit a wall. He's going to help you navigate through some tough situations, right? But you've got to learn how to develop, or excuse me, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you keep relying on following your feelings, you're going to miss it every time. Why is it so important to follow the Holy Spirit? Well, you've got to understand, let's go back to Luke 24. Remember in Luke 24, what did Jesus say? In verse 47, he talked about the repentance and the remission of sins that should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, right? Well, in verse 48, look at what he says. He says, and you are witnesses of these things. Now, it's very interesting. How can you be a witness of these things, right? Well, you can be a witness of many things, but he's going to empower you to be a witness. Look at verse 49. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. What's he talking about being endued with power from on high? What, what is he talking about right there? What is this power that he's talking about? Right? Is it... Uh, is it a magic force? Are it those little crystals that some people like to use? You, know, you guys ever heard of those crystals that have power in them? Right? They sell them. You can buy them in the store. Right? Power crystals. Right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit is what he's talking about. This is, the, this is what he's talking about when you are going to be endued with power from on high. Well, first of all, how can he you know, give you this power... And, and where is it going to come from, and, and how are you going to use it? Well, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 1. I had to lay this groundwork so that we can, we can move forward. Bear with me. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse number 8. Acts 1.8. Uh-oh, look at Jesus talking again. Look at what he says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's what he's talking about here. You're going to receive power from when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. See, what you need to understand is this, is that the Holy Spirit, it empowers us to do works for the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It empowers us to do works for God. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life, it will empower you. And it will allow you to do works for the Lord. 
But now, if you do not allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life, it won't. Right? It won't because you have say of what's going on in your body. You have free will. And so, if you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to move in your life, you're limiting God. You're limiting yourself. Does that mean you can't go to heaven without letting the Holy Spirit move in your life? No, you can go to heaven. But the bottom line is, you're limiting yourself. You're limiting God. God wants to do something big in your life. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit working in your life, you're not going to be empowered to do you know, those supernatural or, or, or extraordinary things. Because that's what the Holy Spirit brings. It brings that, that element, that dynamic part that allows us, mankind, to do things that we normally would not be able to do. So the bottom line is this. God promised to provide the power. We've seen that in Luke 2449. Now we're seeing it in Luke, or excuse me, Acts 1.8. And he gave us this power that he promised. Right? And here, when he's talking in the book of Acts, they're at Pentecost. Right? And the Holy Spirit came upon the whole church and empowered them to preach the word, you know, to the world. Go to Acts 2 and look at right here in verse 1. This was a Jewish celebration that they were celebrating. And look at what happened. When the day of Pentecost came, Acts 2.1, when Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. On Wednesday, we were talking about tongues a little bit. And, you know, what we were sharing is that tongues is a spiritual gift. If you go to the first book of Corinthians, you can read that there. What is that, chapter 11 or 10? You don't have to turn there, but you can read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's nine of them. And what's so awesome is, is that those gifts are, are you know, for us to do the work of God. Right? That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can read that after. But the thing is this. Sometimes people get spooked out about these gifts of the Spirit. But we're talking about these are the things of God. There's no reason to get spooked out. There's no reason to get, you know, all, you know, weird about these things. And oftentimes when we don't understand spiritual things is because we're trying to understand spiritual things with what? This, right? With the soul part of you. You understand spiritual things with the spirit part of you. And that's why you've got to develop the spirit man so that the spirit man, you know, is growing and developed. Because when you're trying to use this to understand spiritual things, it's not going to work. But what I'm getting at here and what I'm trying to share with you is that the Holy Spirit wants to help you. And it wants to empower you with this power that Jesus is talking about. This power that comes with the Holy Spirit can help you have special insight into many things. It can give you insight. It can give you also just so much that you can start tapping into it and God can start using you because you're being Holy Spirit led. But if you're not being Holy Spirit led, you're not going to be able to, you know, how would you say? You're not going to be able to go to that next level. You're just, like I said, you're, you're limiting yourself. And that's okay if you want to limit yourself. If you're okay with the same old, same old. If you're okay with, you know, just everything's okay, so-so. Knock yourself out. But if you want to experience the supernatural, if you want to see 
you know, the supernatural happen, and you want to experience that, and God, you want to let God use you to be a part of that, watch when the Holy Spirit starts moving. People start getting healed from their sicknesses. Right? Great things start happening. I don't know about you, but I want everything uh, that is available to, available to me from God. Everything. And if that means that I might have to step out of my comfort zone and step into an area that I'm not comfortable with, hey, so be it. God is not going to do me wrong. Although I may not feel comfortable, that's okay. This is how I feel. Right? Remember we talked about feelings. Don't be led by your feelings. So what if it's uncomfortable? But remember, God wants to stretch you. And there's going to be a little uncomfortableness in God stretching you so that He can use you. Amen? Because if you think that, that you can continue to, you know, uh, how would you say, stay in a comfortable state of of mind and not have to do anything you know like I said you can stay there but but God can't use you if you're not willing to be willing to go further than where you've been in other words you got to be willing to step out of your comfort zone you got to be willing to say okay God you can use me and uh, you know yeah I may have to give up uh, an hour of my TV time. I may have to give up, you know, uh, an hour of my video game time, right? Uh, I may have to give up uh, an hour of whatever it is that you like to do, but think about it. How many hours are in the day? 24 hours are in the day. 24 hours. How many hours do we sleep? I know everyone here sleeps different hours. Some of you probably sleep 20 hours a day. I don't know. I'm lucky if I get four or five hours of sleep. I'm lucky if I get five, uh, four or five hours of sleep, sometimes even less than that. But guess what? There's a thing called naps. You can take a nap, right? And so the, what I'm saying is this. Knock yourself out if you like to sleep 20 hours a day, right? But the thing is, what I'm saying is, there's 24 hours in a day. Sure, you have other things to do during the day, but at the same time, we can all find time for God. And God's not saying that you need to give Him half your day or you got to do this. He's just saying, give Him some time. Spend some time with Him. Because if you can't give Him no time, how is He able to move in your life? Think about that. How is he able to move in your life if you're not giving him any time? And so that's why sometimes we got to go back to the basics and we got to say, okay, we got to start at ground zero here. We got to say, hey, we got to start, you know, from the basics and work our way up. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's good to get back to the basics. You know, sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. Sometimes we get ahead of God. Sometimes we get all excited about something and, and we think that, hey, we want to do all these great things. And then when we realize the cost that it's going to take, we say, oh, I'm not ready to pay that price. And we kind of slow down. You know, there is a cost, but it's so worth it. He paid such a great price for you and me. Amen? He paid the, the ultimate price for you and I. And so one of the things that he's telling each and every one of us is that he wants us to do something specific and this applies to every Christian anyone who considers themselves a Christian a follower of Christ he says you got to do one thing check that. he doesn't say ten things he says one thing what does Luke 24 48 say and you are witnesses of these things See, this is the theme of the entire book in this one verse. He wants you to be a witness. Witness of what? You've got to understand, the Christian agenda is aggressive evangelism worldwide. 
Did that sound like a foreign language to you right now? Aggressive evangelism worldwide. What is aggressive evangelism worldwide? It's basically spreading this good news of Jesus around the world. That's evangelism right there. And he wants us to do it worldwide. We've seen in Acts 1.8 where he says he wanted us to, to be witnesses to the entire world. So we know that, right? It's a mandate for all Christians. What's a mandate? An instruction, an order. See, we are witnesses who point to Jesus and tell the lost, those unbelievers, how to be saved. That's what we're supposed to do. See, now you may think, how can I fulfill that kind of commission? How can I do, do that? I, I don't know all the Bible. I, I, I don't uh, know all those things, right? The bottom line is this. You're a good witness for your favorite place to eat. Are you not? Right? You're a good witness for your favorite place to eat, Right? You go and you find a hamburger stand, and what are you saying to everybody that will listen to you? Hey, have you guys been to that hamburger stand over there? They got the best burgers around. You got to go over there. And you're telling anyone that will listen to you. You're being a witness for them. You were walking billboard for them. You had a great experience. You liked their food. Price was good. And now you're going to tell everyone that will listen to you, they got to go and have a burger over there. You're being a witness for them, right? You go and see a movie. If you didn't like it or if you did like it, you're going to tell everybody what you thought. Nah, don't go see it. Wasn't good. Bad ending. Waste of money. Get it on DVD. Right? If you did like it, what are you going to tell them? Go see the movie. So what I'm trying to get at, and I hope you guys are following here, is that you know we very easily tell so many other people about all these other things, but when it comes to you know Jesus... He's always left out. You know, you, it's like many of us treat Jesus as that's that area in our life that's, well, that's private. I don't, I don't talk to nobody about that, right? That's private, right? Think about it. When he, you're seen here in the Scriptures, what is he saying? Tell others. Tell others is what he's saying. And, and so the thing is this, is that when you have the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you, it's easy to be a witness. See, witnessing is not something we do for the Lord. It's something that He does through us if you're filled with the Spirit. See, if you're Holy Spirit-led, it doesn't take uh, you know, a lot to share with somebody. And, and what do you have to do to be a witness to somebody? Well, think about it. What was Jesus telling? What was Jesus telling these... Uh, disciples when he appeared to them after he was crucified what, what was he doing he told them to be a witness a witness to what of what they seen and what they heard he wants them to be a witness of what they seen and what they heard see it's no different for us when he asks us to be witnesses he wants us to be a witness of what we seen and heard what we've experienced what has God done in your life what is he doing you know, all it takes is you telling somebody, you know what? I don't know a lot about the Bible. I'm still learning myself. But I'll tell you what. He makes me feel whole. He gives me peace. You know, he's doing this in my life. Things are changing. You know, yeah, I'm not there yet, but he's doing a work in my life. You know, you need the same thing. You know, that, these are the kind of things you can share with somebody. Right? How about just telling somebody, hey, come to church with me. That says it all right there. You don't got to do a whole lot. How about saying, uh, I'll buy you lunch let's, after church. Let's go, to, let's go to church and we'll go to lunch after. Right? How about something like that? Think about it. If everyone in here were to bring one person to the Lord, think about the significance that in, and the impact that we could have in our little world here. Think about the impact that we could have if each of us won one person to the Lord. And, I'm, and don't get me wrong here. I'm not sharing this to fill seats in here. That's not what this is about. 
I'm sharing this is because this is what Jesus told us to do. He says we need to be witnesses. And, and if, you know, inviting somebody means to send them down to a church down the street uh, or in another city, that's fine too. Because see, at the end of the day, it's about building His kingdom. Right? Right? It's His kingdom. We call it kingdom building. you right? It's not about, you know, well, we want to be the next biggest church on the block. That's not what it's about. It's about building His kingdom. And if you're going to reach other people, it's okay to say, hey, I think this church would be good for you over here down the street. Or I think that one's closer to your house. You know, along those lines. But think about the impact that we would have if we were to reach one person, one family, each and every one of us. Think about the impact. Not only are we reaching people for the kingdom of God and doing what God's told us to do, think about these people and these families' lives being changed. Think about it from this perspective. Right now, there's a big agenda in the political realm that's moving, that's doing what? It's taking God out of the public place, right? The kids can't talk about Jesus at school, right? They don't want us doing certain things in the public eye. The list goes on and it goes on and it goes on. You know, they don't want God or Jesus mentioned in the public square. They're saying there's separation of church and state. Why is that happening? Who's making these rules? There's people that we have elected into office. Whether you vote or don't vote, they're elected into office, and they're the ones making the rules. So if we were to double our, our, our voice, let's put it that way, say let's, we doubled our voice, and we all are voting people, guess what? That means that we've just doubled our votes in what? In putting someone in office who's going to represent our biblical Christian worldview. Don't let anybody feed you a bunch of garbage that, that the politics has no room uh, for religion or that there's separation of church and state. Because let me share something with you. You know, one of my uh, uh, talk, Christian talk shows I used to listen to all the time, the gentleman, has, you know, he, he, he died uh, last year in a motorcycle accident, uh, Frank Pastore. He had an interesting concept with his radio show. He called his radio show The Intersection of Faith and Reason. Very intelligent man. And, and what he used to say was that, that politics, all it is is theology applied. Politics is theology applied. Let me explain that. When they say people who don't want you know, any kind of Christian worldview in politics, when they say that, that's a bunch of bull. Because, see, you can be an atheist and be in office and think about it. You're an atheist and you're in office. What is going to be your agenda as a politician? You're going to be pushing your worldview as an atheist. And if your worldview is atheism and you believe in science and not creationism or an intelligent design, when it comes time to say, hey, uh, schools, uh, you know, we, the state of California, give you millions of dollars for textbooks, we want you to buy more of these ones that teach about evolution, that teach about science, that teach these things. What is that atheist politician doing? He's pushing his agenda. Now, mind you, he's not pushing Christianity. He's pushing his atheist agenda agenda. When that gay politician is in office, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to push his agenda. And right now the curriculum from what I'm being told in the state of California schools is being changed to talk about, um, what's that term they're calling it now? Alternative lifestyles. So when they're talking to our five-year-old children, grandchildren, or whoever, you know, we have at those ages, and they're telling little Johnny, you know, maybe, Johnny, you don't want to use the boys' restroom. Go use the girls' restroom. Check it out. You might like it. Experiment. 
Don't you think that's something that we as parents uh, should have the right to teach that in the home and not the schools, right? Or if they tell little Susie that, uh, hey, Susie, it's okay, you know, that, you know, that maybe, you know, you might want to have a wife and not a husband when you grow up, you know. So, you know, it's okay, and they start basically indoctrinating our kids at that small age. If you don't think they're doing it, they're doing it. I've mentioned the uh, power of Hollywood. You know, you don't think that it's purposely done when you're watching your favorite sitcom and your favorite character on the show is the gay brother or the, or the gay sister uh, or the friend or whatever. You don't think that that's not purposely done and put into that show? It's so that, guess what? You can be desensitized to certain things. And although you may be a Bible-believing Christian and know that the Word of God says that that's wrong, you know, you may change the way you think about certain things. Why? Because you're seeing it from a different perspective and basically you're, they're desensitizing you to these things. And it's all done on purpose. And here you are, not even a clue in the world, click, click, Tuesday night, Oh, we got to watch that show because he's so funny or she's so funny. And you're not even realizing of what's happening in your mind. You know, I recently went to a conference and a young lady gave her testimony uh, uh, about how she got caught up in prostitution. And it was very interesting because this young lady shared that she grew up in a, in a good home. She never seen her mom and dad fight. Both parents raised her. Mom's a lawyer, right? Good profession, you know. Dad was a deacon in his church. And she goes away to college, out of state, never being exposed to street life, not being exposed to all these things. And here she is in college, away from home, and she's at a nightclub one day, and somebody approaches her about modeling. She turns it down, but they're smart. Then he sends a girl to talk to her who's her age, who's recruiting, about modeling. And lo and behold, this guy, not only did he have a modeling agency, but he did a, a prostitution thing on the side. And what he would do to lure, lure girls in is, yeah, he would tell them how pretty they were. Hey, ever, anyone ever told you about being a model? I'm sure most young ladies, that's just going to really get their attention. Oh, I thought about being a model. I just needed somebody to tell me, to confirm it, right? Think about it. This is a smart young lady. She's in college. And so she took the bite, called the guy. Yeah, he set up a couple of jobs for her to do modeling because he had a modeling business as his front. But then the day came where he called her and said, hey, meet me here at this time. And uh, she did. And then he says, get in the car with that guy. And then the rest is history. In between all that, he had had her fill out some paperwork with all her personal information, mom and dad's address, all this, like, you know, tax forms, W-4s, all. Guy was smart. So basically his thing was, if you don't do it, I know where your parents live, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to kill you. Of course, young girl away from home, instead of getting on the horn, calling the cops, guess what? She felt helpless, fell into it, and got caught up in prostitution. So... One of the things I'm sharing, why I'm sharing this with you is because when she finally got rescued from this, you know, she had to go through a lot of, what do you call? A lot of uh, psychological counseling, right? A lot of psychological counseling. And, and in all this counseling she had and all these things to basically get her mind right again, she talked about the power of stimulation, the power that when we put things in our mind, and she's given this class to, this isn't a church thing, it's a secular thing. She's given it to us from a, a psychological point of view. And you've been hearing me preach to you over and over again about the power of your thoughts and about what you put in front of your eyes and what you put in your ears, how it has such an effect on you. And here she is telling us about psychologically 
you know, when we put things in front of us and we put it in our, you get desensitized. And she talked about how the power of music, how it desensitizes. You know, these are things that she learned after the fact. And she was preaching to the choir with me because I knew this from a biblical point of view. But she was given this from a psychological point of view. And that's why we got to be careful where we go in our thought life. That's not our message, but we know that our lives head in the direction of our most dominant thoughts. Well, how do we get those thoughts there? Well, they're planted there from something, right? They're planted in there from something we've seen, something we heard. And then as it gets planted in there and as you start to think about those things, guess what? It becomes thoughts. And then your life starts heading in the direction of the most dominant thoughts, what it is you're thinking about the most. And so that's why when it comes to the Word of God, this has to be a dominant thought in your life. Because when this Word of God starts to become a dominant thought in your life, your life will follow in this direction. And this is from a psychological point of view as well. So what I'm sharing with you is... You know, we got to be careful, right? We got to be careful in, you know, in how you choose to associate yourself with other people, right? Because oftentimes, you know, they have this effect on us and we don't even realize it till it's too late, the, this negative impact that it has on us. But getting back to being witnesses for the Lord, we want to be Holy Spirit led. And remember, it's not about you, it's about Him. You have a testimony that you could share. What is your testimony? Everyone in here has a different testimony in regards to, you know, what brought you closer to God? What was it? You know, where were you at that you needed more of God in your life? You could share that with somebody to be an encouragement because they may be going through the same thing. And as you share that with them, they'll know, hey, I'm not alone in this. There's someone else out there just like me. And they're telling me that there is hope out there. That they found the answer. And they found it in the man Christ Jesus. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you as we start to close about being witnesses for the Lord. That is not my mandate. That is the Lord's mandate. You call yourself a follower of Christ? He says, this is what I want you to do. He says it in Luke, what? 24, 40, what was that, 48? 40, yeah, 48. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. See, the thing is this, what's so awesome about our God is He's telling us He wants us to be a witness for Him. To tell people what we've experienced, what we've seen and what we've heard, what we've experienced. And in doing this, in this process, He says, I'm going to empower you to get outside of yourselves with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to help you get out of your comfort zone. Because when you try to do something in and of yourself and your natural ability, you're limited. But when the Holy Spirit is involved, all the limitations are gone. There is no more limitations. Now, there is no limitations. And the bottom line is, that's when the impossible can happen. Now you're stepping into the realm of, you know, where miracles can happen. What is a miracle? Right? What is a miracle? Something that defies what? Logic and reason. When you step into the supernatural, you're going to defy logic and reason all day long. And like I said, God wants so much more for you than just that mediocre, so-so, same old, whatever you want to call it. He wants more for you. And the thing is this, is that when you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, you're going to start to step into that spiritual realm where anything is possible. Anything is possible, and He will use you. Don't be afraid to be used by God. Because He's got some great things in store.
But think about the impact that we could make as his church if we were all to follow this mandate of being that witness for him. If we really took that instruction serious and said, all right, Lord, you want me to be your witness? I'm going to do it. Could you imagine the impact that we could have, right, on this world? And that's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for us to stand up and say, all right, Lord, you can use me. And I'm not going to be afraid of the Holy Spirit when he comes on me. Amen? And we've got to start learning how to listen to his voice and identify when he's talking to us. And that, and that takes, you know, you've got to spend time with him. Because what did he say? His sheep know his voice. How does the sheep know the shepherd's voice? Right? Because they've been following him. They know how to identify the shepherd's voice. It's an awesome thing if you've never seen a shepherd with a flock of sheep. Right? He's got a certain whistle or whatever he does, and they come right sh running. They know his voice. It's almost like your dog at home, right? You do your little whistle, and what does he do? Comes running, right? God is good. Let's get to know his voice. Amen? All right, if I can have everyone just stand and as we close in prayer this morning. I know we went in a few different directions, but I hope you get the point of that he wants you to be a witness for him. Think about it. It's time to get out of the comfort zone. And it's time to get off the sidelines and to get into the game. Right? Let's pray. Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for your word that went forth this morning, Lord. We thank you, Father, for reminding us, Lord, that you have something for us to do. Father, that you, you have something for us to do and that you have the tools that will help us to get that job done. Father, help us, Father, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to get out of our comfort zones. Father, help us to, to just, you know, finally just say, you know, enough is enough. I'm going to do your will for my life. You can use me, Lord. Father, help us to have that attitude, Father, of gratitude and to show how much we love and appreciate you by actually letting you use us for your service, Lord. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, Father, for being our helper and our teacher, and for just giving us that power that will enable us to do the impossible. And Father God, I, I, I pray for everyone here in this church, Lord, that you would use them, Father, in such a mighty way, Father, and that you would remind them that, yes, he can use everyone in this church. Everyone here has the capability and potential to do great things for God. And the only thing that's necessary is to be a willing vessel. All you have to do is be willing. See, the world has a lot of requirements out there. They have criteria. All God says is, be willing. That's it. And Father God, I, I pray for your people this morning, Lord, that as we go through the week, Father, that you would bring to their remembrance this instruction you have for us of being a witness. Help us to ask ourselves throughout the week, am I being a witness for the Lord? Am I being a witness for you? And Father God, I, I thank you and I praise you, Father, for your people. Father, I thank you for their faithfulness. And Father God, we give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And Father, as we leave this morning, Father, I thank you that your angels have charge over them. They're blessed going out and blessed coming in, Father. Father, we give you glory and honor this morning in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. You could be seated. We have just a